If you'll indulge me for just a little bit, um, especially for those of you who are new, I genuinely think that the AU Libertarians are starting to develop a little bit of a, an important footnote in history for some of the folks that we've graduated, some of the accomplishments. So let me just tell you a little bit about my small little tidbit of that history. Um, if you decide to become a Libertarian, plan on taking on fights, but it's going to be fun. I have fun. I mean, you know, poking fun at morons is one of my favorite things to do. <laughs> and uh, the target-rich environment, as things unfold, is just its stunning to uphold. And um, so one of our better professors in the econ department, who was the uh, faculty advisor for the AU Libertarians, was starting to, you know, get a little bit of notoriety. So lo and behold, they got rid of him. And nobody wanted to take his place, oddly enough. So who do they ask to take the place? Not some tenured professor who's supposed to have academic freedom and protection. They get the lowly nobody, untenured instructor to take it. I said, if you can't get anybody else, sure, I'll take it. You know, what can they do? Fire me? Well, I'll have fun with that. <clears throat> now, when I took over the AU Libertarians, um, there was a young man here. He was a graduate student who was part of the, the Libertarian, Scott Kajar. And he said, gee, maybe we ought to do something like, you know, politics in motion. Put it in practice. Listen. Uh, get the message out. See what people want us to do. And uh, oddly enough, one of the local races opened up. So we said, well, our project was going to be to go through working with the state, you know, to get your name on the ballot, running this special election, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Now, foolish me, after coming on this great project, and I learned more than the students, I think, dealing with the bureaucracy in Montgomery was just an eye-opening experience. And lo and behold, who was the only person that was available that was actually in that little gerrymandered part of the district that could run? Guilty. So uh, the AU Libertarians have played a huge role in shepherding me towards my quote-unquote political career, as much as you want to call it, right? I mean, with restrictive ballot access laws, I've got a snowball's chance in Hades of ever getting elected. But you actually go out and you do things and change policy. That's the fun. So um, we went through, ran, that was for um, District 82, I think it was, for the State House. <clears throat> We started to get more and more notoriety. The group started to engage in debates. Boy, the Democrats and the Republicans were not happy about having to debate us, right? I mean, because we'd come at them with, like, logic and reason. That's not fair. Uh, so the, the next thing that came down the pike, and a lot of it, if, and if you all want me to talk about the uh, eminent domain stuff, I'll, I'll talk about it at the end. But um, I kind of like to talk about how the uh, AU Libertarians have been intertwined with this a little bit more. So I ran for um, third district Congress, and the, the Democrats didn't put anybody up, so it was just myself and Congressman Riley, and got 17% of the vote. Or, I'm sorry, got 12% of the vote. It was 12 or 13% of the vote. But in some districts, and they were really starting to get concerned, I was getting 17 to 24 percent of the vote. That's when you start scaring people. You're getting your message out as a libertarian, and people are starting to vote for you. Now understand that you know this small little group started that course, started on that path. And I mean, it's I think it's cool that I look. I don't know any of your faces. That's great. I mean, except for Lauren, I don't know any of you folks, right? I mean, you're newcomers. You're coming down the pike. You've got a whole bunch of life ahead of you. I mean, right, it's time for me on the back nine of my life to handle to somebody else who wants to go and have some fun and do some of the same. <clears throat> well, and once again, players started to come in. The next really big figure that came in after that was Scott Kajar was a guy named Dick Clark. And Dick Clark came in young and really started to shepherd the organization and um, <clears throat> he ended up being the campaign manager for my gubernatorial race the second half. And when we ran for governor, we said, we just put out a call for candidates. A whole bunch of student AU libertarians became candidates, went out and got folks that were candidates. That year I ran for governor, we had a slate of over 60 candidates. 
that actually went out and the press had to ask him questions. Why? Students like you helped force us to get ballot access by state law. I mean, the Democrats and the Republicans were just beside themselves that there were young people out there fighting to actually get their message out. It's like they couldn't believe it, right? I mean, you guys are supposed to be drones. Why aren't you being good little consumers and just, you know, being nice little slaves and not worry about it? Be good slaves. Stop this. Um, sort of the end result of that, many of you know, I got 2% of the uh, the vote, and I really shouldn't say I. It was really we. It was an, an effort that was just incredible. And it beat the margin of victory by about sevenfold. And for those of you who don't remember, like the state of Alabama didn't know who their governor was going to be for weeks because we had beat the margin of victory. One night they said Sigelman won. The next night they said Riley run. And for those of you who really want to look into it, there were some interesting things that went on in Baldwin County and what the Republicans did. And some folks say that's what carried the day. Who knows? Nobody's ever going to know what happens when things get that close. Now, after that happened... Uh, Governor Riley called the state house into special session to deal with the education crisis. They did nothing with respect to education, but promptly went in and gave us like the third worst ballot access laws in the nation. Now, I'm an economist by trade. We like to talk about things like competition, right? And one of the things that libertarians champion is that liberty, right, to exchange, unfettered, Right? Competition. Go out and get somebody's vote by offering the most favorable terms, not because you've boxed out all the other competitors, but you've actually allowed other ideas, other, other concepts into the debate. (laughs) When we announced the run, and once again, there were a bunch of student libertarians who, who were there, we went on the state house steps and it was a cold day in January. So when the press was there, I started with now, the last time the Libertarian ran for governor, it was like 1980, and they said it was going to be a cold day in Hades before one would ever do so again. And as the snow flurry started to fall, I said, well, it looks like that day has come. I won't get into the specifics of the ballot access laws, but because of the efforts of the Libertarians, and once again, Auburn being one of those hotbeds of that activity, we had met the threshold to get Ballot access by state law. There were three major parties that were on the ticket at that time. And that's going to be important in the later part of my conversation. First, right out of the gates, first radio show I'm on, what do they want to talk about? The Ten Commandments. Well, I don't know about you folks, but there's absolutely nothing the government can do to change the power of my God, one scintilla. Yet there's folks out there who want to argue that the government can somehow weaken or empower God. Now, the debate went on between two judges, one by the name of Roy Moore and one by the name of Myron Thompson. Of course, it was an argument that I would liken to a duel of wits between two unarmed opponents. Neither of them had any clue about what the First Amendment was all about. Libertarians kind of like having rules of laws that are followed and made sense, right? When it says Congress shall make no law with respect to establishment of religion, basically those cats that were writing that thing in 1787 and finally signed on to in 1789 didn't want the national government to impose a religion on the states, right? And there were some states, Massachusetts, Maryland, that had their own state religions. Now, the folks that were writing the Constitution knew it was absurd, But they realized that competition over time was going to do away with that. First of all, and and most of all, and I mean, ask somebody. I mean, I'm an Orthodox Christian. Ask me. Why on earth do I need the government to subsidize my religion? What could possibly be a bigger indicator that you have no faith in the power of your argument, much less your God, that you've got to have the government to subsidize it? Now, I love to see the smiles, folks. Don't. You know, that's what I live for, right? I'm connecting. I understand that some of you folks are really, okay, this makes sense. So I promptly say on the radio show, well, you know, it seems that Judge Moore doesn't understand the argument, right? If he had argued it well, there were two remedies in place already to deal with this. If you don't like Roy Moore's interior decorating skills, 
call the state legislature in to change the law that makes him steward of the rotunda. Furthermore, if you don't like that Roy Moore is a Christian of whatever type, vote him out and put in a druid for all I care. I just, it, right? These are market forces at play. And I promptly finish by saying that basically Judge Myron Thompson on the other side wants to become the interior decorator for every courtroom in the East Middle District of Alabama. It's nuts, right? But here's what your federal government has decided that it wants to spend its time doing. When you go on campaigns, right, all you libertarians are gun nuts. All federal gun laws are unconstitutional. It's that simple, right? The Second Amendment says Congress shall make no law with respect to. Once you understand that, a whole bunch of things start falling into place. I mean, I'm one of the few people that have brought a Third Amendment case to the... <laughs> the federal courts, which is fun. Like I say, I'll talk about that at the end. But the next thing that I thought was of interest in the campaign was the resistance, right? The press sort of realizes, yeah, we've really got to talk to this guy because we know he's going to be on the ballot, but we don't want to. He's one of those nasty libertarians. So, I mean, we were kind of, you know, courteous about all that. You know, if you're a private organization, if you're a private newspaper, and you want to be that way, okay. I mean, we don't want to force ourselves upon you. Hopefully your readers will say, gee, this is incomplete reporting. We'd kind of like to hear about all the candidates. And if they don't discipline you, then okay, they're happy with your paper, your reporting. <clears throat> the AU Libertarians played a big role in getting me on the, um, they called it the gubernatorial debates. It was just the forum. And this was in February. Of course, all the student libertarians there, they were just so disappointed at the beginning. Nobody was taking our stuff. They're looking at you terribly. And, you know, why are you people here? And then time after time after time, right, you just drove home the concept of liberty once again and once again. I don't know, maybe you can find that on YouTube or I think I have a tape of it if somebody wants to do it and put it on YouTube so that people can see it. At the end all the libertarian stuff was cleared out. People were not even thinking about going to the Republicans and the Democrats as much. Why? They hadn't heard this stuff before. That's where you become powerful. Get folks to think about it. Well, when they saw how well we did on that debate, many thanks to the efforts of, of your prior organization, they didn't want us to be on the debates ever again. So, the Alabama Public Television Debates come down the pike. We don't get an invite. You don't do that to guys like Scott Kajar and Dick Clark. They are going to get in your face and say, what are you doing? This doesn't make any sense. And that's what they did. We couldn't get any real reply. So, after I won friends and influenced people with my comment about uh, Myron Thompson's interior decorating ploy, we brought a case to the uh, East Middle District and said, look, we have major party status. We belong on the debates. Right? This isn't just the Birmingham News or WSFA boxing us out. Alabama Public Television takes state and federal money. They can't pick and choose. <laughs> well, surprise, surprise, right? They want to give that right to Myron Thompson because they know how he's going to rule, and he basically says, oh, yeah, that's fine. Alabama Public Television... Doesn't want a major party there. They can pick and choose whoever they want. Well, once again, it's one of those moments that you get to really have a lot of fun. What was our next day's press release? Myron Thompson says, back of the bus, libertarians. You can't use this vehicle to get your message out. <laughs> Does it get any simpler than that? Right? You don't have to engage in a lot of legal debates and discussion. It's just that simple. Well, to add insult to injury, right, because everybody wants to paint you as a nut, and I don't know how to respond to when the extremists call you an extremist, right? I mean, we're the ones that are sitting there saying, here, follow the rule of law, right? This is what the Constitution says. And you've got folks in control in Washington and Montgomery that are so extreme and so out of their minds with power and have no idea of what their job really is. When you stand up and say the emperor doesn't have any clothes and they shouldn't be doing that, and they're ready to whack you every which way they possibly can. 
Well, given you know the, a lot of the things that libertarians like to address are ridiculous regulations, right? Social as well as economic. So almost everybody, whenever you go on a radio show, right? Oh, well, you libertarians think that they should legalize dope. Yep, let's drive on. You're never going to convince anybody who doesn't want to be convinced if you want to engage in the debate with them, right? And I mean, I actually am in, in contact with some of the folks who are pretty powerful at times. I remember having the conversation with Senator Sarbanes. I mean, right? All the federal drug laws are unconstitutional. Show me where in Article 1, Section 8 that they're authorized to do any of that stuff. So, you know, I'll talk to Senator Sarbanes about that stuff. I mean, what? We've now surpassed the Chinese with the number of people that we imprison. Mostly over, you know, victimless crimes like drug offenses that have to serve their times. So you let the robbers and the rapists and the real property crime folks go. It doesn't make any sense. So I said, you know, Senator Sarbanes, help me out here. Why do you really care whether this person gets their buzz from nicotine over here, this person from marijuana over here, and that person with a beer over there? Well, John, if I had my way, I'd make cigarettes illegal too. <laughs> right? How do you deal with somebody like that? You're, you, you just drive on, right? Now, I mean, can you imagine how many people would be in prison if you made nicotine illegal? And don't say it. They'll decide to do it, right? I mean, one of the biggest growth industries we have right now is prisons. Now, after you get all that off the table, I mean, one of my favorite uh, endorsements was from the Pink Pistols. You folks know who they are? Bar knows. Who are the Pink Pistols? Second Amendment rights, well, I don't know if it's been, you know, more colloquial women, but it was basically gays, right? They were tired of getting bashed, but said, you want to bash with me? Yeah. How do you like a 45 ACP in your face? <laughs> right? I believe that everybody has a right to defend their property. I don't care who they are. I don't care what they do. You want to start seeing crime end. The, most of you folks know the story of how concealed carry laws came about. There's libertarianism in practice. Nobody. Gosh, I love this. <laughs> Concealed carry laws came along at a time when they actually came up with laws and regulations that were supposed to promote the general welfare of a locality or a state. What do you think happened when folks were wearing their iron out here where everybody could see them? Were they the ones that were getting robbed? No. So what did the law say? You can't show that iron where everybody can see it. You've got to conceal it. What did that do? Confuse the crap out of the robbers. Is that a hand up or just stretching? You don't have to be. There's all sorts of libertarians out there who, you know, we basically believe in as long as you're not going to destroy somebody else's property or make them worse off, you're welcome to... You know, light yourself on fire and drink until the cows come home as long as you don't hurt anybody. Uh, well, now, libertarians are not big fans of murder. It's a property crime, right? Absolutely a property crime, right? You think he would have been as likely to have, have, have had that happen if he could have defended himself, Right? So absolutely. But you don't have to be a Second Amendment advocate. As a matter of fact, I empower you guys to decide whatever civil right you want to champion and go do it until your heart's content. The world will be a wonderful place if you do so. Don't like the Second Amendment? Champion the Third. For those of you who know me, the one that I've spent my most blood, treasure, and toil on is the Fifth Amendment. I'm about to get there in a minute. Now, what starts to happen is when those private responses take place, like with concealed carry laws, people start to see how effective private responses are to get things done. The last thing the government wants you to understand is that people are pretty smart and can start taking care of themselves, and gee, they can actually start deciding what's in their own best interest, and boy, that really takes the wind out of their sails fast when you start learning that. So... The next thing that we decided to put on our plate and knock out was the Williams case. 
I don't think many of you will be familiar with it, so let me go ahead and run it down. <clears throat> the Williams family lived in Marengo County. The State Lands Division took their property claiming that it was swampland, right? Because there are no private organizations that can come and decide to do that, right? The Nature Conservancy and all those places that don't exist. The government has to do this. They paid him nothing for his land. Now, they were at least nicer to the Williams family than some other folks have been. They let them live on their land until they died, but they couldn't farm or log it. Somebody besides me have a problem with that picture? Sound like swamp land to you? Right? The Fifth Amendment has two important clauses in it with respect to property. It says, Nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. Now, why did we like to put that one into practice? And once again, I'm not the guy to invite here to talk about libertarian theory and philosophy and all that. We've got some great ones over in the philosophy department, and you ought to invite them. I'm the guy who likes to get in the ditch and dig. I'm the guy who likes to put my teeth in your behind and not let go. That's all there is to it. I mean, I, that's, that's what I do. So... They pay him nothing. So you certainly haven't satisfied the just compensation, right? If you paid Williams a dollar for the property, you could get into an argument over whether a dollar was just compensation. And so much for the public use, right? It wasn't swamp land when you're farming and logging it. Now, what was the real reason why they took Mr. Williams' land? He was a black who had the, fa the, the family had held the land since like 1872. And they were just some folks in Alabama that didn't like that. Guess what, folks? If you want people to respect your property rights, you better start respecting others. Because sooner or later, the government's going to come after your stuff with just a different excuse. Now, we made a big stink about it. So big a stink that the day before the primary, Governor Sigelman patents the land back to the Williams family. Now, libertarians, there are a few days that are more sweeter than that. When you got to see that press conference and know that your candidacy was the reason why the issue comes up, they actually do something about it, and they're afraid because people are listening to what you're saying. You're shining light on the cockroaches, and they start running. That's a good day. Now, at the same time they do that, there was a state representative, I think it was Thomas, who was supposed to set up a blue ribbon panel to address this issue of, and it was black and mostly poor white uh, landowners where the state lands division had done this for a long time, especially in the 60s was the, the high water mark of it. Have they done anything? No. I think maybe somebody like an economist at Auburn would be somebody to invite on the panel. I'm still waiting for the phone call. What's it been? Seven years later? It's not going to happen. Understand that when you start learning what your civil rights are, and you better learn them, they're just going to keep walking all over you. When I teach this stuff, I tell my students, what's the easiest way to take away your civil rights? Not know them. Simply not teach them. I mean, students will give me answers like, well, you know, you shoot them, you kill them. It's messy. It takes trouble. B bullets are expensive. Right? They've come up with a much better way of doing this, right? It's called government education, and we just decide what they want you to know and what they don't want you to know. The dearth of knowledge in that regard, especially with the kind of money we spend on education, is amazing. You citizens start learning what your rights are, watch them start running for cover. Now, <laughs> when all this stuff starts to unfold, and, you know, it's all coming down to the wire. It's amazing. You know, the phone calls you'll get, the offers, you know, well, if you back off of this, what jobs the government will give you and all that. It's always amazing to me. And I guess I shouldn't be amazed, right, at how often people sell their souls. But even as an economist, I never seem to be the amazement of how cheaply people sell. Right now, you're young. Your souls are intact. Don't let them take it from you. Because they're going to keep doing it, little by little. Before you know it, 
it's going to be too late, too hard, too difficult. You'll be able to come up with a million excuses, right? Oh, you're married now, you've got youngins now, blah, 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 blah. The only way this ends, folks, is if you make a stand. <clears throat> I've always been, you know, quite willing and able. And, I, you know, whatever you want to say, okay, you know, you made your way and you were able to do this. There are going to be many of you that are in the same boat. If you don't do it, other folks won't. Do it for the folks who can't defend themselves. So, I told Briggs to get out the vaudeville hook when he thought appropriate. I assume that is still in force. Um, I got plenty of time. Well, if you want me to talk about the uh, the eminent domain fight, I'll be happy to talk about that. If you'd like me to talk more about you know taxes and regulations, somebody's got a, a marker up there, and you know I'm one of these professor types who's just dying to put something up there. And my guess is that you know some of you folks might just be be you know bored to tears with diagrams and discussions. So, um, you know, I'd, I, what I really wanted to talk about next had more to do with my run as Congress than it did uh, governor. You want me to talk more Congress, or yes, sir? Well, I mean, why do you have that cartel behavior with the drugs? Right, because they're illegal, right? It's not a competitive market. Um, one of my favorite economists ever, uh, when I was at Clemson, wrote a, a, an article entitled Bootleggers and Baptist, The Education of a Regulatory Economist. And once he headed up the FTC, he wondered why all these people were coming and trying to lobby him to do things, trying to create those exact cartels that you're talking about. And it finally dawned on him Right, that the reason why the bootleggers were giving money to the Baptists and supporting their campaigns was as long as they made sure that booze was illegal, what did that put in their pocket? A whole bunch of illegal money, right? The only way that the bootleggers were going to exist and prosper is if it was illegal. Now, I mean, to your more specific question, there's not a lot of evidence to suggest that cartels last in a marketplace very long. Why? competitive attempts to get rid of them. My, and, and when I teach this in class, my favorite illustration and example to give, and it's showing you how much of an old fart I am, but at least most of you know what OPEC stands for, right? The Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries is one of the easiest cartels to understand, right? These countries get together and they try to restrict the flow of oil to raise the price. And when they tried to do that in the 70s, and of course, you know, the government is playing games with currency, the price of a barrel of oil went fourfold within a year. A lot of it was because of their restricting the flow of oil in the markets. Well, what did they immediately start to happen? See happen. When that price started to explode fourfold, you had all those little cheaters on the cartel starting to crank out oil like crazy putting them aside, you know, a lot harder for the Saudis to be able to see and discipline. I mean, the Saudis are basically the ones who were disciplined and holding the cartel together. These are countries like Kuwait, Qatar, that, that cheated on the cartel. Well, basically what happened was, man, we've got this good cartel thing going. We need to have this controlling mechanism come in and deal with it. So what did, you know, the Nixon administration and, you know, not trying to pick on the Republicans because the Democrats have just as many ridiculous things to pick on. But, you know, old Tricky Dick comes out and says, oh, you can't charge anything more than 69.9 cents for a gallon of gasoline. It's not right. It's not fair. Well, I mean, all of you understand what happens there, right? When are you going to buy more fuel? I mean, the market clearing price was a buck a gallon, right? And they said 70 cents. So quantity demanded is way up. A whole bunch of folks are wanting it at the artificially low price. Ah, but what did it really accomplish? They used the federal government to restrict output and keep it artificially low. Now what's interesting to me as a libertarian in practice is when you put those things in place, wow, watch the distortions. So how did gasoline get allocated? When green and white slips of paper, there were a whole bunch of folks waving money. Not all of them were getting gasoline, though, were they? So how was it allocated? 
spent a lot of time in line, right? Almost all of you, right, see pictures of the 70 gas lines and all that. Now, what's really brilliant about that, libertarians? What are you using while you're getting fuel? Fuel, right? You stood there, boom, you started up your car, moved up three lengths, waited until those folks filled up. Boom, started up your car, go another three lengths. You got to waste fuel while you're buying fuel. For those of you who are the big green tie-dye tree-hugging folks, that's really great for the environment, right? All those emissions while you're sitting there. I mean, the cam's not designed to burn at those low RPMs. It's ridiculous by every margin. I mean, if you really want to get into command and control stupidity, I grew up in Maryland. Some folks called it Night Maryland, but I'm not going to go there. They came up with this brilliant idea that folks could get fuel on Monday, Wednesday, Friday with odd number tags, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday with even number tags. Anybody want to dare to forecast what happened to the number of stolen tags in the state of Maryland? <laughs> right? You're out of fuel, it's a Tuesday, I've got the wrong number tag, you go and snag a tag, right? Go get your fuel, and man, as soon as you're done, you fling it into the woods as far as you can. Brilliant. So, I mean, what actually happens, I know I've taken a long road to answer your question, is what you in fact observe is more cartel behavior, more of that monopoly behavior, when you have a command and control government. Uh, I don't know if you guys uh, bothered to watch the news today, but Pfizer, who I'll pick on if you want me to talk about the Kilo case and the, and the uh, Fifth Amendment stuff, just got whacked with one of the biggest fines in the history. Why? It's all that cartel behavior. I mean, Dan Quayle, who a lot of folks, you know, held up as a nut because he couldn't spell potato, who cares? What was one of his big things that he was trying to do was open up the FDA allow people to engage in experimental drugs if they want to. Right, Borough Welcome, boy, when they got the monopoly on AZT, they didn't want other new drugs to get tested. They want the monopoly. Now, how on earth, ladies and gentlemen, did we ever survive all those years before an FDA? What was it called? The market. Market discipline. What you have now are a bunch of folks who believe that drugs are safer than they are because the federal government has put the stamp of approval on it. I mean, for those of you folks who like, you know, look to the government for social regulation, do you really want those cats in Washington dictating your morals? Can you imagine a more ill-equipped group to do so? Well, take that same concept, and as an economist, I can tell you it unambiguously applies with respect to industry, with respect to businesses. At Ford Motor Company, ladies and gentlemen, I saw more regulations come down the pike to extract wealth from consumers than you can imagine. I mean, things like airbags, calf regulations, emissions regulations, passive restraint regulations. And I was on the warranty side. I got to see the really ugly underbelly of it. I mean, for those of you who actually believe in recycling, up until some kid smashed the crap out of it a couple years ago, I still own my first car, and I still own my second car. Drove it for 25 years. Planned on driving it forever. Why? Took care of it. I could fix it myself. I hate my new grand marquee. Why? I hold title to it, bought cash for it. Do I really own it? I can't fix that thing. I might be able to fix 30% of the stuff on it. Now, was that contrived? You bet. Now, I'd love to be able to buy my 77 Charger Daytona new today, built like that with the improved machining and improved materials. I think the government wants that to happen. No, they want cash for clunkers. They want you to get out of those cars and get into some new transportation appliance that's going to be dead with a half-life of five years so that you keep buying, you keep spending, let's keep consumerism alive. Now, has anybody bothered looking at the damage to the environment on all that? You've been paying attention what they have to do with those things before they let them go to get their $4,500 that it looks like they might not even get? Destroy the engine. Now, how's that for recycling? How's that for a sound environment? Now, what economists, especially ones of the libertarian sense, instead of trying to judge the outcome, they just like to sit back and watch what happens. I mean, right now in Auburn, and I'm not as plugged in to the repair facilities and stuff here as I used to be, but I'm forecasting that about three or four really good, well-established auto repair facilities are not going to make it to the end of the year. Why? 
And that's a trend that's been happening for a long time. You're absolutely right. Folks who would be repairing their cars because of this new little piece of crack they smoked called cash for clunkers had a whole bunch of people buying cars that would have otherwise been repairing them. So happy days. GM calls back 1,300 workers. How many are going to lose their jobs nationwide because of this most recent distortion? It's not $4,500? 600,000 cars, right. But I mean nationwide, for folks who are selling cars that are not getting repaired, I mean, what does that come out to per state? Not good at math. Right? 50,000? I don't know. Uh. Um, I was just talking to some of the people I'm still plugged into that say that when all this stuff started coming in, how people coming in and saying they were going to repair their cars and keep them, and then there were folks who just said, nah, don't do that repair. I'm going to turn it in for my $4,500 clunker. That's what they're, that's right. I don't know what, whether they're going to go in, in fact out. That's what they're saying to the, the folks that I'm plugged in here locally. Um, here locally. And beautiful. So, so you've given me the segue to the, to the next one, right? Financing problems. The government comes along and gives all sorts of monopoly power to financial institutions. I'm just absolutely amazed at how much this administration has decided to continue the policies of the past and seems to be more than willing to stand behind Wall Street. And I know a lot of my, my friends and family, right, keep asking me, when am I going to get back into the market? When am I going to get back into the market? I'm not getting back into the market until it's allowed to take out the trash. Right? All they've done is stopped market discipline from taking place. Now, I mean, occasionally you'll see it cut down enough. I mean, right, finally it cut down enough to get rid of Colonial Bank, which was one that was pretty easy to see. Right? I mean, I, for those of you who, who know some of the local players, right, tell me how you can have one little bank like Auburn Bank right next to another bank, Colonial Bank, that decides not to succumb to the re-regulations, not succumb to saying, oh yeah, it's okay to give this easy money. And they say, sorry, even though the government says it's okay for us to use that money, we think it's a stupid thing. So that bank stays strong. Its stock doesn't get whacked. It, well, I mean, it did go down a little bit because banking stock in general, but it got nowhere near as hurt. What does that tell you? The banks that survive that are good stewards. They're good stewards for their stockholders. They're good stewards for their employees. They're good stewards for the folks who made the loans. They're good stewards for their consumers. Now, what does the government come along and do? Oh, if you're a really badly run bank, we're going to give you a bailout. Let's make sure we prop up the really crappy ones. Yeah, that's market forces in action. Now, when you start doing that, all the malinvestment that keeps shepherding itself down the pike just keeps getting worse and worse and worse, right? A lot of this is just inflation. People decide to make investments because they don't understand inflation. And there are people out there who really believe that when the government was just throwing money all over the place, that the price of their homes or the value of their homes really went up 30% in one year. Are you nuts? Now, I don't know about you, but I mean, there's something that kind of makes sense about taking resources away from Moron. Why? Because you might actually get them into the hands of people who are good stewards. They're the ones that do generate jobs. They're the ones that actually do end up giving you long-run stability, start, you know, creativity, creative destruction is what economists call it. And for those of you who, who know about, you know, a lot of what's taught at the Von Mises Institute, that's one of the things they really champion. Right? I mean, if it was up to the federal government, we'd probably still have buggy whip manufacturers. Let's bail them out, right? Heaven forbid you let those folks go out of business. Now, once you start to realize how absurd that is, then you start to say, well, gee, yep, what are you going to do? Do you really believe this omnipotent government is going to come along and make these decisions better than individuals who are making those decisions and deciding on their own? In my class, I don't allow students to use things like socialism, capitalism, uh, you know, totalitarianism, all that stuff. It's got an ism on it. It generally ends up just 
murkying the water. Ed Mansfield said that basically you can set up a system of property rights and they evolve out of three ways. Tradition, command or command and control, or the market. And you really start to cut to the chase, right? When people sit there and, I mean, they're willing to fight to the death the difference between these two administrations. I just don't want to get into arguments over what smells better, chicken poop or turkey poop. It's just, it's a waste of my time. But when you can start getting people to identify, yes, this was a command and control administration, the one before it was a command and control administration, the one before that was a command and control administration, you start taking the wind out of their sails. I mean, there are a lot of people who believe that politics is a pendulum, right, going left to right, left to right. It's not a pendulum, it's a ratchet. Right? It goes back and forth, and all they do is keep ratcheting it down to more and more big government, more Leviathan. And as long as people are willing to believe that government can allocate resources much better than you folks making your own decisions, the problem's going to get worse. Now that's what libertarians are really all about. They say, yep, come in, define, enforce, defend, allow the peaceful transfer of property in voluntary exchange between consenting adults. Just do that, government, and watch how your life will improve. Now, I know I say that to some of you out there, and my best friend in the world is best friend at my, or best friend, best man at my wedding. We were altar boys together back to Baltimore. He's just got that anarchist bent in you, and I know some of you guys have that too, and you know, you get uncomfortable when I even start talking about that little system of stuff. And I'll tell you the same thing I tell him. Right now, we're fellow travelers, right? We both want smaller government and we want freedom. You know, when we get to some system of rational property rights, when you actually have the federal government follow its constitution, when the state of Alabama follows its state constitution, right, it's pretty clear. It says when the government does anything besides defining, defending the life pursuit of of happiness, it's a usurpation, it's a pretty simple notion. When we get there... If you want to keep going, I'll bid you farewell. But at least stand with me and walk with me while we try and march to at least get a little bit more freedom and a little bit more um, sanity in government in that regard. So, I'll close with my Fifth Amendment fight, unless the hook's coming out. You tell me. I'm. It looks like I've got about ten of Ten minutes? You guys going to stand me for ten minutes? <laughs> this abbreviated version goes as follows. For those of you who know the Auburn area, I had a very nice home, three bedroom, two bath house. I'm kind of a redneck and I like to fix my own cars. I had a shop that ends where College Avenue ends in a T at 280. <clears throat> in February of 98, I had a couple of bureaucrats knock on my door. And uh, after we had asked them, you're you're so earlier, uh, they said, no, no problem. The road's not even going to go this way. It was going to go some back way off the rest area. They were coming to take my home. Okay. So they said that this house, and uh, they weren't going to take all of my property. They were only taking about seven-tenths of the acre. <laughs> <clears throat> was worth $59,800. We said, fine, you find a three-bedroom, two-bath house with a nice shop where I can fix my cars a mile or so outside the Auburn City limits, and we'll move in tomorrow. We don't care if you pay a buck for it. I don't care if you pay a million dollars for it. Just, you know, and, of course, what started to make them absolutely batty is I'd read the Alabama Code, and, right, it says replacement reproduction is just compensation. All they want to do is talk about fair market value. I don't allow my students to use that four-letter F word, fair, unless they're prepared to define it. <clears throat> so we said, okay, well, we'll just wait until we have our day in court. And, you know, and I understand that you know, juries can do all sorts of, of wild things, but that's nice, right? I mean, you go to a jury and you leave it with them and say, if you say this place is worth $59,800, fine. The pox is on you guys, and we just leave. <clears throat> well, we're going through all the machinations. I keep pointing out how they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing along the way. <clears throat> so they start doing neat little things like coming on my property without permission, 
which, once again, being the, with all due respect, Second Amendment fan that I am, whenever I went out to talk with him, I just decided to put the 44 Magnum in my belt. I mean, nothing really says hi like a root. <laughs> And, of course, right, they're wondering, you know, and they see somebody living out in the, you know, sticks or whatever they thought it was, you know, who is this redneck? Well, here's the game in the abbreviated version, right? They make you homeless. I'll talk about that in a little bit. They expect you to be paying a mortgage. We paid that house off in 95. They expect you to have to pay to live someplace else, and they expect you to have to pay for representation. Most folks don't have the resources to do that. I've already told you, folks, it's what I do. As a matter of fact, students like you kind of shaped me into becoming that person that I was by that time. I mean, some folks like to go to Bermuda. I like to go poke fun at Morons. Well, this was a target-rich environment. So, they, you know, would come and burn fires over our house, and I'd Bless my bride's heart. I have no idea how she endured this. I think if she had known what I was a priori, she would have never had the poor sense to marry me. <clears throat> they crushed the sewer line. Right? So you can't really... Well, I'll leave it to your imagination. There was one of the two things you liked to do in the bathroom that you could do. Um, they didn't crush it completely enough, and I rigged up a line so that my bride could at least use it a little bit. It came to fever pitch a little bit before Thanksgiving, right? And they really like to play games with your holidays. They drop bombs before, like, Thanksgiving, Christmas. It was nice to watch their tactics. The same thing they did to Suzette Kilo, if you know the Kilo case. So <clears throat> we call them backhoes, you know, the big things that have the claw on them. When we won't move anywhere, and, I mean, I had students, some of them were AU Libertarian students that would come and, stay at my house so I could go teach my classes and come back. I mean, this was pretty ugly stuff. Um, when it came at the house and it sort of raised the big claw up, I mean, once again, that pesky Second Amendment, I decided to come to the door with an M14. <laughs> it decided to back off. And it, it, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's thinking back, I mean, the stuff that you do in your mind. I had a little Jap maple that I had planted for an occasion and I had that as my marker, that I mean, if he had crushed that, then I was going to open open fire. Um, and later on, I went out and I scratched my head and I said, you know, are you nuts? It was like, because I figured, well, I could prove that he came so close that he smashed that Jap maple, right? I mean, here's this huge backhoe putting ruts in my lawn in the yard. I mean, it wouldn't have been very hard to, to prove how far um, he had gone. Now, here's where... As libertarians, especially if you decide that you're going to champion this, you really need to take to heart, right? It wasn't a, a slip of paper that had, you know, Congress shall make no law with respect to, you know, bearing arms that brought me comfort that day, right? I mean, it was a piece of wood with a metal tube and, I mean, right powder that could do something. And that, that thing is put there for a reason. And, and I, I know it's strange, and you probably know very few folks who have really exercised the Second Amendment as it was intended. But I can tell you that, I mean, I don't think he would have had any problem just coming and crushing and, and driving on if it wasn't for that. So, it comes to loggerheads. We go into Judge Nix's court. Judge Nix is a pretty decent guy. And the uh, highway department decides to go outside the eminent domain code because they're not doing very well there, especially since I knew what the heck it said and could defend myself. So they went outside the eminent domain code to evict me from my own home. And Judge Nick sort of looks and he says, I really don't know what weird statute you're coming up with this. I haven't seen it, you know. He calls them into chambers and basically gives them one last chance to do right. And they don't. And I mean, these are really some arrogant, nasty people you'll find along the way. And that's not true about everybody at the highway department is not a turd, right? Not every person that's a bureaucrat is despicable, right? I mean, I'd like you to think that at least some of the professoriate are decent. I mean, I know at least I try to be. Um, <clears throat> so basically, they state in open court that we are holding up the highway we must be removed to raise the house immediately. That's an important word. 
<clears throat> well, Nick looks at it, says, and I was in the back, right? I'm, I'm not even allowed to be up there to stand while they're taking my crap. Isn't that nice? And uh, he knew who I was, and he looked at the back, and he said, the Mr. Sophocles, you have that nice brick home at the, uh, the end of College Avenue, don't you? And I said, well, yeah. He says, well, it's really not all that nice now, you know, with all the stuff that's going on there. I said, you're, you're absolutely right. He says, well, I have to come up with some sort of bond for you to pay so that you can appeal this. He says, um, it's 300 bucks a month to stay in your own home, okay, until you get this cleared up. Fine with me, Mr. Nix, right? I mean, I didn't care what it was. I was going to pay it. But, man, here's giving me this nice, easy out to go and appeal it. The highway department goes ballistic, right? The judge doesn't play ball with him, gives me a real easy way to flush him out. So the highway department threatens me with a $10,000 a day fine if I stay in my home and appeal, which I found pretty interesting. I said, okay, show me where in the Alabama code you're authorized to do this. Couldn't get any answer to that. Well, this, the, since I'm trying to do the abbreviated version, basically we leave, you know, it started getting people scared or whatever. So <clears throat> we go. They do not raise the house immediately. They don't turn the power off. They turn the power on. They find the sewer line that they've crushed and repair it. They get the water turned on. Now, does this sound like they're raising it immediately to you? And they live in it for several months. Now, let me make sure that all of you understand. I got to drive by my home that I held legal title to, was paying taxes on, to watch other people living in it, while I was paid nothing waiting my day in court. Now, that's how people operate. Sounds like something a National Socialist would do, right? This is America. If you folks aren't willing to make those stands, and once again, I make no bones about it, that I'm blessed enough to be able to fight this. I can actually read text and stand up for my own. You guys are the best and the brightest that we have. You don't make it to Auburn University by being a moron. I'm expecting you to not act like one, especially if you're going to be a libertarian. Go out there and defend yourself. It makes a difference. So, the day before they're going to have to face a jury, our house magically becomes worth 145000 Still 30000 less than it was appraised for. it. They know how to play all those margins. right? I wasn't going to spend another 30000 in attorney's fees to just waste time in court to get 175000 But you sure love asking the question, now that we're bringing all the civil rights violations, when were you lying, guys? When you said it was 59800 making me homeless? Or when you paid 145000 after making me homeless 11 months? Now, what really makes them sick is I know the code, and we follow it. The only thing that could be determined in circuit court was just compensation, even if they had wanted to determine the civil rights violations. Couldn't be addressed. The code prohibits it. And right, all we wanted to do was get that out of the way. Right, that's just money. What I want to hammer them on is the civil rights violations. And I want them to hurt. Why? So they don't do it to other people. Now set my case aside for a moment. Let's talk about the Golson case. It was a little further down, 280. And I'll put this charge to the Libertarian Party. I think Helen Golson is still alive. Do a story on her. Why don't you go to the state legislature and make the Golson Law? And this is what the Golson Law should be a, a remnant of. Mr. Golson had more property than we did. He had enough property left over that he could build another home behind it. So Mr. Golson is saying, okay guys, tell me how much I've got. And he was a very adept man. He could, you know, do a house from a foundation up. But he was in his mid-60s, as I recall. Keep playing the same game with him, offering him about a third of what it is. And he says, look, I'm an older guy. All I really want is for somebody to come and dry me in. I'll do the electrical, the drywall, the plumbing, the tile, put down the floors and all that on my own. I just I don't want to do the bulwark. I'm too old. You all understand what I mean by drying you in. You basically just 
put the outside exterior up in. No, nope, they keep playing the same game with him. <clears throat> what happened? They found Mr. Golson dead on his tractor doing what? Starting the footers for the foundation and all the bulwark that he didn't want to do. Now, I mean, understand, folks, that right? that's what happens in the end. I mean, most folks don't bother counting how many people are killed by calf regulations or all the government regulations that make vehicles so much more unsafe while they're trying to convince you how much more safer they've become. You'd be amazed at how much better off the things that you could buy would be if you let market forces dictate it. So, I mean, Mr. Golson was just a victim of these tactics, of these policies. Now, in the East Middle District of Alabama, we drew a very good federal judge by the name of Susan Walker, ruled in our favor three times. And basically, we had the issues of trespass, I mean, like I say, the Third Amendment, right? There were folks who were quartered in my home in times of peace, I mean, I think the last time we declared war was, what, 1941? I love the Ron Paul comment, right? Once we stop declaring them, we stop winning them. What a novel idea, follow the Constitution. <clears throat> um, do I need to get off? I, all right. So the, the short version is she rules in our favor three times. They go judge shopping for Myron Thompson. Of course, Myron Thompson's going to rule against me, uses the Rooker-Feldman doctrine stuff, we take him to the Supreme Court and win unanimously. I mean, basically, uh, Myron Thompson's argument showed that he didn't understand the difference between the word plaintiff and defendant and winner and loser. <laughs> right? and, and then he gets mad at us and we've embarrassed him, right? I didn't embarrass him. He doesn't need my help. He embarrassed himself. Um, so the Supreme Court ruled in our favor, sent it back down and said, yes, you're supposed to give this guy his day in court. Um, Myron Thompson sat on it for about three years. He wrote exactly the same stuff, only he changed some of the words so that he could say he did something different. And now it's back at the 11th Circuit, and the 11th Circuit scratching their heads because, right, I mean, Myron Thompson's the Democrat who likes to steal property because he just likes to steal. The 11th Circuit is the Republican morons who say, oh, you steal property to give to these contractors and folks who give to our campaign. All oh, Myron Thompson stuff looks great. Well, now, right, the 11th Circuit's in a tough place. They really don't want to stand behind this ridiculous ruling a second time now that the United States Supreme Court has already ruled unanimously in our favor. So, you know, when you're ready to take on a fight like a dozen years, then, yep, you've got to be about as much as a fun curmudgeon, whatever oxymoron one you want to use as I am. And, um, you know, I don't know what else to, to say except in closing is that, you know, the libertarians are the hope. I mean, I look at the young people and I look at the folks that are willing to do. I mean, I know there's other Scott Kajars. I know there's other Dick Clarks out there. I mean, I got to see him. I was the faculty advisor for the Student Libertarian Party for many wonderful years. And um, I, gosh, when you see this kind of turnout, what else can you say except for the future's bright? And um, I think you guys will live up to it. Thanks for having me. <laughs>